from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Headless Horseman of Paoli by Daryl Schweitzer It was during the time when the Pennsylvania countryside explodes with color in the fall when the hills and fields are a riot of yellows and reds and fiery oranges when the farmers come to harvest what spring and summer have left them that was when I met him that was when it all began I was late of course I was supposed to be at the Brandywine Museum for the first showing of a newly discovered series of paintings by an 18th century Pennsylvania artist and represent the historical society at that function but somehow it didn't look like I was going to make it there on time. For one thing, I had taken back roads all the way, cruising slowly to let the local color sink in, savoring every minute away from the bloated monstrosity somebody had the gall to name the city of brotherly love. Besides that, I had stopped to talk with an Amish farmer. The Amish are very friendly people, really, and the guy waved, and as soon as he saw that I wasn't about to poke a camera in his face, he called me over, and we had a very pleasant conversation. That took time, though. So there I was, late to a distinguished meeting, but in no particular hurry, driving along a back country road between two cornfields, when I met the horseman. If I had been speeding, I might have hit him. He seemed to just appear on the road in front of me. A little ways up, ahead there was a grove of trees, and one of the fields ended for a while. He must have ridden out of that, but I certainly didn't see him. All of a sudden, there he was, and that was all. I almost honked at him then, but from the way he was acting, I knew something was going on. I paused cautiously, unsure what to do. He sat still as a statue in front of me, mounted on a massive black stallion, holding out a leather bag in one hand as if he wanted me to take it. I looked in my mirror and saw that no one was coming, put the car in neutral, set the emergency brake, and got out. It was then that I noticed how the fellow was dressed. He had knee breeches on and huge white stockings. His shoes had brass buckles on them, and a sword hung at his side. I couldn't see his face because there was a cape over it. He seemed to be sitting up straight, but I knew he had to be crouched under the cape because I couldn't see his head or even make out where his shoulders began. There was absolute stillness about him. His horse didn't whinny or sputter, and he didn't say a word. There was no sound at all save for the purring of my auto engine. I wasn't sure what kind of gag this was, but I thought I might as well go through with it now that we had gotten this far. So I took the bag. It was made of real leather and tied shut with a thong. Whatever was inside was round, about the size of a melon, and weighed a few pounds. I had a distinct feeling as I held it that something was very, very wrong. Then the horseman suddenly sat up perfectly straight. He turned to me, threw back his cape, removed his ruffles, and unbuttoned the top of his collarless white cut shirt. I could see his chest then, and his neck, but not his head. He didn't have any. It was gone smoothly sliced off as if by an executioner's axe. The wound didn't look fresh. There was no blood. He bowed to me, reined his horse, then galloped off in absolute silence. I didn't hear any hoofbeats. There was a strange, fluid-like quality to his movements, like something taken with a slow-motion camera. He rode across the fields and he was gone, and as soon as he was out of sight, the birds started chirping again and a dog barked somewhere nearby. Like I said, 
I had this feeling that something was very wrong. I looked down at the bag I was holding, the thong tight thing of very old leather, and I felt sick and scared. I didn't want to know what was in it, although of course I already did. I half ran, half stumbled up the road until I came to the trees and there I found the sluggish, marshy stream. I threw the bag into the water and hurried back to the car. I tore out of there doing 90, trying not to even think about what had happened. I wasn't late for the showing after all. That was how it all began. I had hoped the affair was over, though I should have known that I couldn't get off the hook that easily. I was still shaky throughout the ceremonies, but I managed to get by. It was as I was driving home, on the highway this time and doing 60, that I happened to glance down, and there on the seat beside me was the bag. It didn't even look wet. I almost lost control of myself and the car right there, but I managed to pull off onto the shoulder before going completely to pieces. Now calm down there. There's nothing that's going to happen to you as long as you're not British. It was the bag talking. The state I was in, I was built willing to believe anything. Uh, I'm not British. Good. Then let's get acquainted, shall we? I am Giles Hewlett, lately. Although I'm not sure how lately, as I'll explain in a minute. Of the Continental Army under General Washington, at your service, sir. And who might you be? Who are to be my benefactor for this coming year? David Stiles. I'm with the Historical Society. What's this about the coming year? Oh, years, years, years. The good Lord knows how I try to keep track of them. How many has it been? You're in historical whatever, so you can tell me. I lost count a long time ago. How many years since what? Since the battle, my boy. Sounds since I got killed at Paoli. I trust you've heard of. You mean the Paoli massacre in the revolution? Massacre? You say it was a massacre? Too bad. Those were all good lads. I wouldn't have known because I got it myself too early to see much. Say, Will you be a kind man and Christian gentleman and take this bag off so I can see? I've been in the dark too long. I jumped then, as if every muscle in my body decided it was time for a collective convulsion. I was almost able to accept the fact that I was talking to a leather bag, but to touch it, much less open it, seemed more than I could stand. Well, come on, come on, I won't bite you. So I did. Giles Hewlett had a ruddy face with high cheekbones. His hair was long and tied behind his head with a ribbon in the manner of his century. The color hadn't gone out of him despite all he'd been through. I felt sick again. I remembered an old legend I'd once written up as a filler for the Society's journal. It had to do with a soldier who'd had a dream the night before the Paoli massacre and rushed to warn the Americans. He got there the same time the British did and got massacred himself. Ever since then, he'd been riding around the countryside, giving his head to people every year on the anniversary of his death, and presumably reclaiming it once the terms of this ectoplasmic lend lease were up, or something like that. But there was one thing I was sure about. It was no story. That's better, the head, Giles continued. Now... As I had asked, how many years has it been? It's been a while since anyone has taken me in like this, and I've been a little out of touch. You are a trusting soul, sir, and I appreciate it, though I do wish you would come out with a number of years. Well, this is 1980, and you died in, uh, when was it? We historians tend to forget dates sometimes. It's about 200 years anyway. Two hundred years, and the world has changed so marvelously. If only Maggie could be here now. Who's Maggie? A preacher's wife. Her husband was a very proper and strict man. 
and good to her, I'm sure, when he was around. But he was away a lot. He neglected her in favor of the pulpit so much that it was a sin, I dare say, a sin. I was, shall we say, setting matters right the night before the battle, and His Holiness showed up unexpectedly. I was just able to slip out the back window before he saw me. I rushed back to the camp, and as I got there, the redcoats arrived. You know the rest. But I heard a different version of the story about you having a vision. Hellfire, lad! I didn't have any visions except one of Pastor You-Know-Who barging into the room before Maggie and I could make ourselves decent. Whatever you heard about me, put aside. I just told you what really happened. Some history will have to be rewritten. Lots of history will have to be rewritten with people like you writing it. But come on now, it's best we don't argue. We have 12 months of each other's company yet. There is nothing you can do to get rid of me, so why don't we become friends? I'll excuse you for throwing me in the swamp because you didn't know, but there has better not be any more incidents like that. Uh... Okay, Mr. Hewlett, you can call me Giles. We'll be the best of chums before the year is out. Sure, I said as I restarted the car and pulled out into the traffic. A plan was forming in my mind. I knew what I had to do. Giles, I said after a minute, wouldn't you like a better view? You can't see anything down there on the seat. I'd be most grateful. I do want to see what marvels man has wrought over the centuries. I rolled down my window, picked the head up and said, take a good look. Twelve months indeed. And before he could answer, I threw him out, then reached over and tossed the bag after him. I glanced briefly into my rearview mirror and saw him bounce once or twice before he disappeared behind me. I pressed the gas pedal all the way down and violated both speed limits and common sense the rest of the way home. By the time I pulled into the apartment yard, I was almost positive that I was crazy. I was seeing things. I needed a drink desperately, and I remembered a fifth of brandy I had been saving for a rainy day. I hurried up the outside stairs, fumbled for my keys, and let myself in. I headed straight for the refrigerator and opened it. Inside, Giles was waiting for me. Don't ask me how he got there, but he was in my refrigerator lying on a platter among the leftovers, looking remarkably like John the Baptist. I slammed the door shut, but he called through it. It's no good. You can't get rid of me. Didn't I tell you that once before? You have been most rude to me, sir, most rude. You are trying my patience. Then the refrigerator door opened by itself, and Giles glared at me. I will forgive you once again, since it has been so long since anyone has taken me in. But I demand, sir, that you promise on your word of honor that you will not cast me away again. I looked toward the door, then to the telephone. I thought of calling the police, then realized how futile that would be. What exactly would I tell them? Okay, I said, you win. Now what exactly do you want? Why, Mr. Stiles? I merely want to be your guest and your friend. So reluctantly at first I allowed Giles to become my house guest. I got him a clean platter and continued to keep him in the refrigerator at nights. I eventually found the bag behind the refrigerator. He didn't seem to mind the cold though and it was as good a place for him to stay as any. Things settled into a routine. Most of the time Giles would watch television. He had wanted me to take him on a tour of Philadelphia, but with remarkable difficulty I managed to dissuade him. It wouldn't do to carry a severed human head down a city street. I argued. It didn't matter if he could talk or not. The court would probably overlook that. People tend to ignore such things. So my TV became his window to the world. He watched the news, shows, movies, dramas, and just about everything except situation comedies those he could not stand despite the fact that we were living one. No, I'm being unfair. I have to admit that Giles helped me a great deal in some of my research. His everyday knowledge of the 18th century proved invaluable. 
even though I sometimes have difficulty explaining where I got my information. He wouldn't leave the television until the test patterns came on, but after that he was willing to talk as long as I wanted. He didn't seem to need sleep. We were up at all hours of the night discussing little-known historical facts. Did you know that Washington had a terrible fear of spiders? One night, some of his men placed a bucket of them in his tent, and he came running out in the middle of the night, waving his sword and yelling, The British are coming! The British are coming! Until his orderlies could calm him down and give him a few stiff jolts of homemade whiskey. That isn't in any of the history books. Basically, Giles was an ideal house guest. Aside from his fondness for television, he made few demands of me. It really didn't cost anything to keep him either. So, once I got used to him and we made an unspoken agreement that I wouldn't try and dispose of him, we got along very well. Basically, Giles was an ideal house guest. In fact, things went splendidly until Pam showed up. Pamela Gray is my Maggie, only she isn't married to anyone. We've been friends for quite a while, and I may even love her, but I can't be sure. Somehow, I hadn't thought of her when Giles came. I wasn't sure how I was going to introduce her to him, or even if I should. There are some things, after all, that woman is not meant to know. And the presence of a severed head in her boyfriend's refrigerator is undoubtedly high up on the list. Giles was watching an old Gary Cooper film when she drove up in her Toyota. Fortunately, I heard the gravel crunch and looked out just in time. And without saying anything more than, Miss, my God, she's coming, I turned off the western shootout that was unjust then and stuffed the protesting Giles into the refrigerator as Pamela began to ascend the stairs to the apartment. I had just slammed the refrigerator door shut when she burst in. The outside door wasn't locked. Hi, Dave. What's that you put in the fridge? Nothing, nothing at all. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, come on, hon. I saw you rush over and shove something in like you didn't want me to see it. There's nothing there, honest. You're lying. Would I lie to you? With me, yes. To me, yes, also. I'm offended. She tried to get around me, but I blocked her. She fainted, dodged, and tried to get around the other side, but I stopped her again, keeping myself between her and the refrigerator. If there's nothing there, then why can't I see? She draped herself over me, her hands folded behind my head. She started chewing on my arm. She does that when she wants something. Says all that black and blue means she loves me. Just a little peek, she whined, chomp, chomp. Come on, what's so terrible? Chomp. All right, you win. There's a lemon pie in there. I didn't want you to spoil your figure. I'll go on a diet. With that, she stomped down hard on my right foot. She's a big girl, and it hurt. While I was hopping around in pain, she forced her way past me and said, Sorry, I was clumsy, and opened the refrigerator door. And screamed. And turned to me like I was some three-headed flesh-eating gargoyle. And screamed again. And ran out of the apartment shrieking, Murder! Help! Police! Murder! Twenty minutes later, the police arrived. They certainly made a big enough production out of it. Sirens wailing and lights flashing. A patrol car skidded to a stop in the courtyard of the apartment complex. Spewing gravel everywhere, two cops came thundering up that rickety wooden steps. Giles, what can I do? Just hold them off as long as you can. Act naturally, as if nothing has happened. I'll think of something. That's easy enough for you to say. There was no use arguing. I had to go along with him. So I sat down at the kitchen table and pretended to read the newspaper. I glanced over the lead story, some grisly thing about a machete murderer. The officers knocked, and before I could yell, it's unlocked, they were inside. They were both big guys, the kind that must have been football stars in school. I didn't feel like tangling with neither of them, let alone both. This would have to be a peaceful confrontation. They stared down at me as if from some unfathomable height. Are you David Stiles? Yes, I am. And what brings you here, may I ask? Care to sit down? 
May I get you something? I had to be pretty nervous to rattle off lines like that. We have a complaint against you. Really? What's the problem? I gave them my best shocked. I have nothing to hide expression. God, I was so close to panic. They looked at each other, unsure of how to phrase it. Ahead, said the shorter of the two after a pause. Ahead? Ahead indeed. It's probably attached to shoulders. They tend to go together, you know. For has it not been written that in the land of headless men the one-headed man is? Mr. Stiles, we have a very serious charge against you. About the head, the lady said, Head? What head? No head here except possibly myself. I reached over, took the top off the sugar bowl, handed it to the cop and said, Hey man, want to buy a lid? I think we've got a psychopath on our hands, Nat, said the shorter policeman. Or else a wise ass, said Nat. Or a combination of both. Then they both turned serious and the first one intoned in his very best Jack Webb voice. Mr. Stiles, a certain lady whose name shall remain confidential, says she saw a severed human head in your apartment. We're here to look around and maybe arrest you on suspicion of murder. Or more than that, if you don't, behave yourself. Murder. But I haven't murdered anyone in nearly three weeks. Surely my arms, heads, or whatever that I might have lying around would have gotten mighty putrid by now. Do you smell anybody? I mean, anything? She said it was in the refrigerator. I think we'll just have a look. Nat made for the refrigerator. I panicked and tried to get up, but a heavy hand on my shoulder forced me back to my seat. Just you stay put, said the other policeman. I knew I'd had it. I had done my best, but that wasn't good enough, and I was finished. They found Giles, and that would be that. When they saw my reaction, they knew they'd found what they'd come for. Nat opened the refrigerator while his partner, still standing over me, looked on. Gentlemen, said the thing on the platter, I am Giles Hewlett at your service. Pardon me if my host seems a little ungracious, but due to the irregularity of the... They both left in a hurry. They made no attempt to charge me, arrest me, search me, or even close the door behind them. Their car screeched out far more furiously than it had come in. Only this time there were no lights. I really felt sorry for those two. I wonder what kind of report they handed in. The weeks with Giles turned into months. I didn't see Pam anymore, and I didn't miss her as much as I thought I would, so perhaps we weren't in love after all. Giles and I became the best of friends, or at least as close as we could considering the situation. Countless times I found myself wishing I had been born in this century, so I could have known him while he was uh, living. The following summer I overcame my fear of traveling with him and the two of us went to Europe. I had some trouble getting him through customs, but I finally convinced the officials that he was made of plastic and a prop for my amateur ventriloquism act. Very realistic, someone remarked. He was amazed by the way Paris looked now. Where's the fat king? As he was with Rome, Madrid, Athens, and just about every other major European capital except London. He wouldn't go to Britain. I told them that the war had been over for a long time, and that America and the United Kingdom were allies now. But he was still one to hold a grudge. You're being ridiculous, I'd say. David, you've never rushed back from a lovely bounce between the sheets and then swish. Off comes your head, or anything else. Now have you? Well, no. Then who are you to judge? We flew back to New York without ever stopping in London. In the months followed one another, wonderful months, growing months, learning months full of discovery, but they made up a year eventually. The best year of my life, but a year nevertheless. Which was the catch? One part of the legend which I had come upon in my research in the first week, but which I refused to believe was very simply, that anyone who accepts the head of the headless horseman of Paoli will die within the year frequently on the same day, a year later, when the horseman retrieves his head for another round of what I suppose you could call the old give and take. I procrastinated incredibly. It was the day before our anniversary, 
when I finally asked Giles. Yes, David, I'm afraid it's true. It does seem to happen that way. Well, why didn't you tell me? Well, zounds, man. I thought you knew. Besides, you were having such a wonderful time, I didn't want to spoil the fun. I was silent for a long while after that. I paced back and forth in the kitchen. I banked my fist against the walls in frustration until the apartment shook. Giles could only follow me with his eyes, rolling them from side to side. Isn't there anything we can do? Not that I know of, he said glumly. Can't we stop it? I mean, him, I mean you. I'm confused. If you're you, then what's coming in your body, I mean? David, I have pondered that long and hard. I think I am on earth still as a kind of purgatory, and the body is a demon or maybe some other kind of spirit sent to see me through it. Silent chap, really. Never said a word to me in all my two centuries. Your purgatory? I was no saint, you'll recall. Well, how do you stop a spirit? No idea. None? So I paced and he rolled his eyes for a while. I looked at the clock on the wall. It was 4.30. Was this my last afternoon? I asked myself. Was I doomed? What does a man do when a relentless demon is coming for his best friend's head, that being all of him there is to come for, and his own life? You could get an exorcist, I suppose, said Giles at last. A what? Like on that weekday morning supernatural series, Exercise with Gloria. Gloria Grimm? I know her. You know her? My mother went to her all the time to have her palm read. She was very superstitious, believed in ghosts and all that. I paused, unable to finish, staring at Giles, who gave me a strange look. Well, don't just stand there gawking like a moron. Do something! I looked at the clock again. Yes, her shop closes in half an hour. Come on! I stuffed them into a shopping bag, raced down the stairs, and all but leapt into my car, pulling out of the driveway in a storm of dust and gravel and leaves. I drove crazier than I ever had before, and I really believed in guardian angels or whatever then, because I didn't run over anybody or get flagged down by a cop for all the fire hydrants I smashed into. Three or streets I one weighed the wrong way, but I made it. The Malvern Bargain Plaza stands in the middle of nowhere, desperately trying to become somewhere. Fortunately, business is so bad, the access roads are never clogged. At five of five, I screeched into the parking lot, grabbed Giles, nearly flew out of the car before I'd even come to full stop, and raced breathlessly into the enclosed mall. Gloria Grimm's little shop was between the shoe store and Gimbel's. It had been there before the shopping plaza was even built. Rumor had it the developers had tried to run her out, but something had happened, and they built a place around her. There she remained, doing a modest but steady business, driving out devils, reading tea leaves, and the like. Above the door was a blinking neon sign, Gloria Grimm, Gypsy Witch. She was a lot older than I remembered her, in her 80s at least. There she sat behind a black satin-covered table, frail and wrinkle-faced, but stiff and tough-looking as an ancient oak, peering into a glowing crystal ball. Silence, my son. Be calm. The spirits are about to speak. Besides that, it's nearly closing time. Gloria, Miss Grimm, it's me, David Stiles, remember? She looked up, and a broad smile cracked her face. Yes, how you've grown. I remember when you sat on my knee. You look so flustered. What's the rush? You gotta help me. Oh, but it's so late, and I'm tired. I'm not as young as I once was, Davy. Couldn't you come by tomorrow morning, and we'll have some nice hot chocolate, and you can tell me all about it. It won't wait, and in a nearly incoherent fashion. I tried to explain it all in one sentence, which was garbled, as was the next one explaining that, and the next, and the next. If I could put in a word here, said Giles. She looked at the bag in astonishment. 
You throw in your voice, Davy? I couldn't say anything, so I reached in and took Giles out. How do you do, madam, he said. I watch you on the television regularly. She reached under the table for the switch to turn the crystal ball off. My God, it's real. Oi, bae. I just work here, you see. It's a living. I want to retire to Florida like everybody else, but this? Davy, what have you gotten yourself into? Giles explained it, all of it, calmly, clearly. Well, well, she said, shaking her hands nervously. I'll do what I can. I, I have connections who might help. Please do whatever you can, said Giles, and quickly, I pray you. Yes, yes, such a nice boy, too. She took a telephone from under the table and dialed furiously. A pause. Oh, damn, she died. And I haven't gotten the new number. Dialed again. Hello? What? Not until sundown? Well, leave a message. It's Gloria Grimm. That's G as in Goddard Damarung, L as Lilith. Yes, yes, okay. Damn answering service. Another call in. Yes, I'm fine. How are you? A little gray malkin. Oh, did you leave out a bowl of milk for a knife of the whole tip? He gets very angry if you don't. Look, I'm in a bit of a sticky situation. You remember Davy Styles? Uh-huh. Look, can you round up everybody and get them over here right away? No, you don't have to file a flight plan. Thanks very much, dearie. So we waited. Gloria marveled at the sight of Giles and questioned him endlessly about ectoplasmic engrams, life beyond the veil and the like. They could have gone on all evening while I sat there scared and forgotten. But then the guests began to arrive. First there was another old, old lady, dressed all in black, wearing a conical hat, who set a broom made of twigs against the wall so gingerly you'd think it was a rare and delicate work of art. Madam Midnight, Gloria called her. Then there was a teenage girl, barefoot and wearing jeans and a t-shirt, but with an owl perched on either shoulder. A tall, thin woman in wine didn't seem to arrive. The air grew blurry from a second, and there she was. An elderly bearded man came in a box, which seemed to float into the shop by itself. Three United Parcel men followed with three more boxes, none larger than a violin case. They adjourned to a back room. I heard scraping and dry rustling, then the Our Father being recited backwards, after which they left, taking the boxes with them. After which a tall, pale fellow in evening dress joined us at the table. A dwarf dropped from the ceiling. At last there were twelve of them, including Gloria. We're all here, she said, except the black man. No coven would be complete. But before Gloria Grimm could finish her sentence, an enormous black man, wearing top hat, tucks, tails, and spats, with a cane over one arm and a monocle in one eye, strolled in, shutting the door behind him. He smiled broadly. Well, my children, all of us are present, I see. He set a briefcase on the table. On the lid, printed in huge letters, was a comment. The great Jumbolo is the greatest. There is no other. Baron Samity. On the inside was a rave review from the New York Times Leisure and Voodoo section. Shall we begin, said the great Jumbolo Bolo. I have never seen such a sight in all my life. The black man shaped two lumps of wax into vague semblances of human heads. He placed jowls between them. He made me sit forward with my head down on the table next to the other three. Then he began a prayer or invocation. The others joined in, chanting, ranting, yelping, dancing around the table with their hands joined. At one point everybody was wearing black goatskins and ram's horns, but the air was so thick with incense I couldn't see much. It went on all night. I felt myself dozing off, but Jambolo nudged me. No, Mon, you must stay awake or else your soul turn into, how you say it, pretzel? The shadows seemed alive. Some of them had wings and were flapping around above me. 
There was a flash of lightning and a clap of thunder. That's it, I told myself. Now the security guards hear us. This will be hard to explain. But they didn't come. I only knew it was morning when the music started and the fountain outside were turned on. It was a relatively quiet part of the ritual and I could hear the water splashing. Oh dear, said Gloria. She fumbled under the table, got out her crystal ball, hooked an extension cord to it and plugged it into a wall socket. He's coming. He's crossing the parking lot now. I turned and looked, and there inside the crystal ball was the image of the horseman gliding across the pavement between the lampposts. I hope We've done enough, said the dwarf. It would be a shame to ruin such good work. I have the thing you need, said the great Jambolo. He took a flask out of his briefcase, opened it, and a wisp of white smoke floated in the air, not going anywhere. It is a tame spirit, he said. For some reason, I could hear the horseman this time. His horse's hoofs chattered on the polished floor. He was inside the mall now. Quick, hissed Jambolo. He touched my head, Giles and the two wax models. He snapped a finger and pointed, and the white cloud drifted into the ear of one of the wax heads, and the thing began to melt and shift. I was too numb with astonishment to be surprised by anything at this point, so I took it in stride that the thing became a perfect replica of Giles, as did the other one. But I was upset perturbed and even terrified when I found myself looking down on my own body seeing how I had slumped over the table unconscious. I was drifting among the winged shadows and incense fume. I felt another presence. Somehow I knew it was Giles drifting with me. I floated around the room as if my head was weightless and I couldn't turn it. Sometimes I saw only the ceiling but sometimes I was looking down. I was looking down on myself, on Giles, Jambolo, and the rest when the horseman came in. He knocked once, and the latch on the door dropped away. The knob didn't turn, but the door swung open all by itself. In he came. Everybody except Jambolo backed away from the table. Gloria hovered in a far corner, but the rest of them retreated into the back room. Only the black man faced the specter face to neck. He was magnificent. Looking for something, Mon? The horseman was silent. He approached the table. Suddenly, the eyes of all three disembodied heads opened. They were so alike now it was hard to tell which was Giles and which were the imitations. Which was exactly what was intended. I am the real Giles Hewlett, said the first. Take me. No, I am the real Giles Hewlett. They're both lying. It's me. The horseman paused. And as he did so, Jambolo grinned a wide grin and shuffled the heads like nuts in a shell game. Which one, Mon, you choose? The horseman stood there, put his hand to where his chin should have been, and puzzled the situation out. All the while, I was drifting dizzily above, alternately looking down, up, and sideways. At last he pointed to the metal head. It's yours, said the black man. Then he went over and lifted me up by the hair. Even though I wasn't in my body, I felt the chill of his touch. When I saw my face, I felt sick. I looked terrible. My eyes were rolled up so that only the white showed. I was pale and slack-jawed. Drool ran down my chin. Dead, said the black man, no soul and body. The horseman let go, and my forehead banged against the table top. Without a word, he left. Come on out, he's gone, Jambolo called, and soon the whole coven was seated at the table again. Two heads remained. One of them was turning into plain wax again. The other remained. Giles? The incantation began. It was as if a sudden gust of wind blew through the place. Suddenly, I was whirring on all sides. I was falling, the shop was gone, and I was high above a dark valley, swooping down 
between two snow covered mountains, which glowed from a sunset somewhere behind them. The crags below glowed a sullen furnace red. I was in the hereafter, beyond life. The landscape all around was so desolate, I wanted to cry out, but I was just a cloud without a voice. But then a wrinkled, bony hand on the end of an arm a hundred miles long grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and dragged me back to this world. I saw the room again, blurry and swaying and blacked out. I awoke slowly, numb all over. I wanted to touch my face with my hands to assure myself I was still there, solid once more, but nothing touched. I opened my eyes. At first I thought I was buried up to the chin in the middle of a vast plain of black velvety sand. Then no, a hospital bed with black sheets. I saw the giants looming over me and I screamed. Hey, what is this? Help! You can't do this to me. And I saw myself sit up groggily, open my eyes, and look around amazement. Zounds. The voice sounded terribly familiar. Giles! David! What are you doing in my body? That's my head you're wearing. It was true. Oops, said the great Jumbolo. Oops, said Gloria Grimm. Huh? grunted the dwarf. I'm sorry, Davy, said Gloria Grimm. These things happen. It's not your fault. We had to get you out. So you'd be dead and he'd leave you alone. Well, get me back in. For the first time, the odd thought came to me that a loose head should not be able to speak, lacking lungs, but by now I had faith in the supernatural. Do what you did again and put me back in my own body. Jumbolo picked up the wax head, which was no more than a formless lump now. Too late, he said. Yes, said Gloria, I'm afraid. The new fitting has hardened. To undo one of these would take a long, long time. How long? About a hundred years. But I'll work on it. I believe she will. See, she's such a sweet old lady. As for the others, they left as unobtrusively as they'd come. I suppose I had to thank them for saving me. So I did, but in truth I wasn't too pleased with a lot of them. Unfortunately, there are no malpractice suits in magic. Well, said Giles in my body, after they'd all left. I shall enjoy being a whole man again. Really, I shall. And he walked over to the door. I may not have been scared before, but this was the one instant of hopeless, despairing terror. Giles, you can't just leave me. He paused. He looked hurt and ashamed. I don't know what he was thinking, but he must have reconsidered or understood what he was doing or something. No, I, I never. You're my friend. He put me in the shopping bag. Gloria Grimm drove us home in my car. We had a hundred years to kill. Giles, an immortal spirit of sorts, cannot die. He sustains my body without aging it. And his head, made of ectoplasm or whatever, I can last forever, too. The world gets stranger and stranger. He lacked so many of my everyday skills. He could never pass for me. He couldn't drive a car, do my job, sign my name to a check. So we had to give up the apartment, sell everything, and go on the road. He could have taken the money and run off, leaving me holding the bag, in the bag, so to speak, but he never did. We went on the road together. Our adventures were endless. Eventually, we began working for a circus, traveling from town to town, giving disconcertingly convincing performances of ventriloquism, or so the press said. Waiting a hundred years for Gloria Grimm, who will surely last that long to set things right. Did you know the shows keep logs just like ships? They do. Topeka, ahoy. <laughs>